I've been asked to give two presentations today, so I was working with my colleague Emily on the research mapping framework, but actually um, I allegedly spend half my time as program director and half my time as an academic doing research, um, which actually doesn't ever happen. All I ever end up doing is admin and presentations of this kind, but when I do get the chance to do research, um, this is what I research in. So I wanted to give you an overview of my research and, um, and really touch upon two individuals that have um, kind of been the inspiration of my career, um, Alan Turing, which is quite fortunate given that I work at the Turing Institute, and, um, and Thomas Bayes, um, for those of you that know statistics, is um, he, Thomas Bayes himself wasn't a statistician, um, but um, he has inspired a lot of the um, best areas of statistics, I would argue, over the past, um, well, past couple of hundred years. And so, one of the things that people, my clicker's not working, oh yeah it is, it's just slow. Uh, so one of the, again, for those of you that have just joined, I didn't deliberately have a yellow background on my slides. Uh, this is um, it's just a display um, quirk. Um, I guess it must be the Mac not fully working with the Windows based setup that they have here, but never mind. Um, so, often people think of Alan Turing and um, Christy mentioned him as an individual being quite multidisciplinary, um, but the kind of key thing, in my opinion, that helped uh, the Britain and its allies to win World War II through the work at um, Bletchley Park and other places was the fact that Turing was actually a statistical data scientist himself. Turing in Bletchley Park actually constructed a multidisciplinary team, so he brought in cryptographers, he brought in language experts, he brought in what was the equivalent of computer scientists, and crucially, he actually appreciated the value of statistics um, and brought in Jack Good as his key statistician. And, um, and through statistical data science, um, Turing was actually able to um, break the um, Enigma code, and I'm gonna try to walk you through some of that work and then bring it right up to modern day and the kinds of things that I do. So the key thing, I am a statistician, um, and I've got a role at the Royal Statistical Society, so I'm kind of trying to, the whole point in this presentation is to give a bit of an overview of what I do, but also to convince you that statistics is really what underpins data science and artificial intelligence. So if you don't know anything about statistics, then I encourage you to learn a lot more, um, because fundamentally that's what we're all doing, um, and that's what Turing was doing at Bletchley Park too, and that's what he realized. Moreover, um, it's not just any old statistics. Um, it's a particular type of statistics that is crucial to solving real world problems. So there's an excellent paper um, that Turing published himself. Well, he wrote it in 1941, um, but sadly it stayed classified and in GCHQ's archives up until 2012 when they um, thankfully opened it up to public. And so um, I recommend everybody, um, for those of you that are interested in, um, in Turing's work and anything to do with um, probability and, and cryptography, I recommend you read this paper. Um, it's also, a, you can actually search for Turing on archive, uh, which is quite cool. So Turing's paper there, somebody's typed it up in, um, in, in PDF, for, PDF format, so you can read this paper. But I've extracted two quotes from Turing's paper, um, which suggest that Turing himself was a Bayesian statistician, and that Bayesian statistics was a key part of the um, of the um, ability to solve and crack the Enigma code. So Turing him, himself said, the probability of an event of certain evidence is the proportion of cases in which that event may be expected to happen given that evidence. So the key word in that phrase is given that evidence. Um, so what that suggests to me is that Turing was thinking about conditioning on evidence and he was thinking about a latent space over which he was going to determine a probability distribution. So that suggests that he's got a kind of Bayesian um, underpinning to what he does. The kind of the more stronger evidence um, comes through the second quote from this paper. The evidence concerning the possibility of an event occurring usually divides into a part about which statistics are available, i.e. a likelihood function, um, and a less definite a part about, one wi about which one can only use one's judgment, i.e. we need to elicit prior information, we need to elicit expert information, combine that with the data, and do that in a mathematically rigorous way, i.e. we utilize Bayes rule to combine these two sources of information and produce a posterior distribution of interest. So Bayesian was def so Turing was definitely a Bayesian statistician, which, um, which in my opinion is quite cool, and not many people know. And actually there's stronger evidence to suggest that Turing was a Bayesian statistician because Jack Good, who often doesn't get the credit that perhaps he deserves in terms of the work that he did at Bletchley, um, published a paper again, which I recommend um, you read if you have the time, um, in 1979, which um, 
gave an exposition of Turing's statistical work during World War II. And you can see that the thing that underpins Banbarismus, the algorithm or the, the, the approach that Turing and his collaborators adopted, um, relies fundamentally on um, the computation of Bayes factors. And, uh, and, and you can see this, the, the expression here, Turing actually introduced himself the expression Bayes factor in favor of a hypothesis. And what you can see there is the um, ratio of um, marginal likelihoods, using modern terminology, I suppose, um, so, i.e. the ratio of probability of evidence given H1, our um, hypothesis under consideration, divided through by the probability of the same evidence conditioned on the null hypothesis. And that's, um, as we all understand, the um, base factor to be. And Chorin did some cool stuff around actually trying to improve the computational time by introducing decibands and various other things that I've not got time to talk about today. But he really did think in terms of um, how a traditional kind of data scientist or artificial intelligence expert would actually view the world in the sense that he was thinking statistically, and that underpins everything that they did at Bletchley Park in terms of cracking the enigma, and he was also thinking in terms of reducing computation time. So it was actually really cool in terms of what they were doing. The other cool thing in terms of, in my opinion at least, in terms of using Bayesian statistics, if you think back to the... Um, well, I guess none of you can think back to the 1940s, but um, if you can think back to the statistical community in the 1940s, um, a lot of the community, in fact, most of the community were publicly saying that Bayesian statistics was a load of nonsense and you had to go down the frequentist routes. And for 40 or so years, after the work at Bletchley Park, a lot of people were still saying Bayesian statistics doesn't have real-world application. Yet Turing and Jack Good knew that Bayesian statistics was the core component that actually broke the Enigma code. So... I don't think I would have the scientific integrity nor the ability to not say Bayesian stuff is really cool and it's actually um, done all this stuff. And so um, even more respect to Turing and Jack Good within, in that context. So moving on to my own research. Um, so inspired by the work that Turing did essentially in model selection um, and also in the computation of Bayes factors. Um, so I'm going to focus on the expression on the, um, that, that ratio term there. And I'm just going to focus on the computation of the marginal likelihood. Um, so that is com computing the evidence. I'm going to change the notation slightly because uh, I don't like Turing's notation. Uh, forgive me uh, for saying that. And um, I, I'm going to kind of introduce more conventional notation. So the traditional way in which we compute the marginal likelihood, for those of you that know um, Bayesian statistics or statistics in any sense, is to introduce a latent variable or introduce some missing data and integrate over that missing data um, such that we can compute the expression of interest. So this expression, what I've done here is to drop the conditioning on the hypothesis or the null hypothesis because it's the same computation that we need to perform irrespective of, well, conditional on whichever model we're um, conditioning on. And so that's the conventional way in which you would um, compute the marginal likelihood. There's a paper back in 1994 uh, by a researcher over in the US called Chib. And what Chib did was to introduce a concept known as the basic marginal likelihood identity. And essentially what he did was to take Bayes' rule, so if our latent space is theta, um, so we've got a posterior distribution over theta conditional on the evidence y, what Chib did was to essentially rearrange um, Bayes' rule such that we have the marginal likelihood computation, which normally sits in the um, denominator. Um, he, he, he flipped those over, so we have the marginal likelihood equals to the likelihood times the prior divided through by the posterior. And you think, okay, what does that give us? How does that allow us to compute uh, the marginal likelihood? Because in this case, we've got an analytically intractable integral that we need to compute to be able to, often, um, to be able to compute the marginal likelihood. In this case, what you've done is just to rearrange things, but you've still got this posterior distribution which you can't often compute in practice. So what does that actually buy us? Well, it actually buys us quite a lot if you're a modern statistician. So what Chib did was to take that previous expression and just take the log of the expression, uh, because that's what a good statistician always does, is to take the log of, um, the, of anything that they're working with. Um, and you can see by taking the log, I've now changed notation again, so we've got the log of the marginal likelihood. So this is an approximation now, which is why it's got the hat over the top, um, is equal to the log of the likelihood plus the log of the prior, um, subtracting the um, log of the, an approximation to the posterior distribution under, uh, of, of interest, evaluated at some point theta star. And what Chib spotted you know, quite coolly was that if you can use MCMC-based algorithms to approximate this posterior distribution, 
which is what we often do, um, well, at least I often do, perhaps some of you do as well, um, to approximate that posterior distribution, then you can utilize this posterior, these sample-based approximation to this, plug it into this expression, and, um, and, and evaluate your marginal likelihood. So that um, basic marginal likelihood approximation is actually quite a cool thing to, um, to, to have spotted. The key thing here is that you actually need to estimate the density associated with the um, underlying distribution. So you've got a set of samples, which are Mar Markov chain-based samples, um, and you need to approximate this density such that you can evaluate that expression and compute the marginal likelihood. So what Chip did was to use a kernel density approximation and used a very simple um, density approximation algorithm in this expression. The work that I did was to spot the fact that you can generalize the work that Chib did and introduce something that I'm calling the L kernel density approximation. And literally, this took me about 10 minutes um, of work, so it's a couple of probabilistic manipulations which actually result in a kernel density estimator, or rather, sorry, a density estimator that outperforms asymptotically a kernel density estimator when you're utilizing Markov chain Monte Carlo as your underlying inference mechanism. So I will just talk through um, these steps. So what I'm doing is to introduce a, a Markov kernel L, and it's a conventional Markov kernel with some conditions on it, technical conditions that I won't bore you with. Uh, but essentially, when I integrate um, that kernel with respect to y, that integral equals 1 because it's a probability measure. So the first line, all I'm saying is my target distribution pi is equal to my target distribution pi multiplied by the number 1. Okay, I've not done anything fancy there. Often, what we do when we look at the target density, uh, we've got a part that we can evaluate and a part that we can't evaluate, i.e. we have an unknown normalizing constant. And so it, if this was a posterior distribution, the z would actually be um, the marginal likelihood computation. Um, but what I've got is a ratio of something that I can evaluate and something that I can't. So all I've done is to expand the definition of what my target density is. Then what I do, um, I'll, I'll um, annoy the cameraman and I'll jump down here just so I can actually um, see, sorry. <laughs> um, what I'll do is to just introduce the ratio of pi divided by pi. Uh, so again, I'm just introducing, um, I'm multiplying everything by one. Um, and I'll expand the, um, this um, pi expression um, to be, again, by definition, the ratio of the um, density that I know divided through by the unknown normalizing constant. And the critical thing, so you think, OK, this is all very well and good. What's that giving us? All I've done is to introduce more terms and multiply lots of ones here, there, and everywhere. The critical thing is that these two normalizing constants now cancel out. So the thing that I don't know, I've now got rid of. Um, and I've now got an expression. Um, that I can utilize. So I've got an expression which involves um, the unnormalized density. So in Bayesian terms, that would be the product of the prior and the likelihood, but completely unnormalized. So it's not a probability measure in its own right, but that doesn't matter because the rest of the expression allows me to kind of implicitly normalize that probability measure. Um, and I'm multiplying it. If you just look at that integral, uh, because I've got it with respect to a probability measure, that means by definition it's an expectation with respect to pi, i.e. the target distribution. So I'm computing um, an expectation with respect to pi of the ratio of this arbitrary kernel that I've introduced divided through by the um, unnormalized target density. So I've been able to go from my target distribution that I don't know how to evaluate the normalizing constant to an expression which involves, involves an expectation with respect to pi. Um, and a bunch of things that I can actually compute analytically. And that's quite cool because I've just run an MCMC algorithm. Well, the underlying assumption in this talk is that I've run an MCMC algorithm to approximate pi. Um, and what this L kernel does is actually, if you think of how a kernel density estimator works, um, you essentially kind of put a Gaussian kernel over each of the sample points, um, very crudely at least. What this L kernel is doing is effectively acting as a kernel in the in in the context of what one would use in a kernel density estimator. And that allows us to essentially to have a density approximation to the underlying um, target probability distribution pi. And that's quite useful, because then when I plug that back, if you remember back to where I started, um, I'm looking at marginal likelihood computation. Um, I can compute um, the, I can evaluate the distribution at any point um, with respect to um, 
the samples, uh, well, the density approximation is with respect to the samples from my, um, the outputs of my MCMC algorithm. There's a bunch of um, kind of theoretical results around this work that I don't want to go into today, but essentially, uh, because this is an MCMC-based algorithm, and I'm exploiting the fact that there's Markov dynamics in the underlying process that I'm using to simulate the samples and approximate pi, you can actually show asymptotically that this estimator um, is more efficient than a traditional kernel density estimator. So what I've got is a better approximation to the posterior density in a Bayesian case than I would if I used a, a standard um, kernel density approximation approach. So I'm, what I'm saying is that I've now got a better way of approximating the posterior density um, and uh, some of these technical conditions, but fundamentally what it looks like when I've got a set of samples, um, this is what my density looks like in terms of my density evaluation. Um, I plug in uh, my samples through the L kernel and then at any point in the probability space that is valid, um, I can evaluate this approximation to the actual um, posterior density and we've got almost sure convergence results and so on and so forth. So like I say, I've now got a cool way of, what well, I think is a cool way of estimating a posterior density which I can then use in CHIB's basic marginal likelihood density estimator, marginal likelihood estimator, and utilize that for model selection, which would be, um, this may sound a little bit arrogant, I'm sorry if it does, but I would hope that if Alan Joran was standing here today, and I wish he was, then he would think that this was an appropriate approach to use given the kind of current state of statistical computation and the utilization of Monte Carlo methods. So just to give you an example that nobody really cares about, um, there is a data set that statisticians always analyze, which is known as the galaxy data set, and it's to do with velocities of galaxies in, um, in, in, in I don't know, uh, Actually, I've never really analyzed what the data means. I've just looked at the numbers, so I couldn't tell you what actually the data means. But essentially, this is a histogram of the sample points. And the key thing that people, statistician, statistical community do is to try to fit a mixture model to this, um, to this data set. Um, but nobody knows how many components should be in that mixture model. So the model selection, um, model selection problem in this data set is to establish how many components. So you could probably, you know, we could argue whether there's um, two components, i.e. one around this um, mass of data and one around that, or whether the three, or whether it should decompose into four uh, to count for the, um, the, the data at the right-hand side of that diagram. And rather than us arguing about it, uh, we should do what Turing did, which is utilize a computation of marginal likelihoods and essentially base factors in his case and to establish what we think the most appropriate um, number of components is. And in this case, um, what I did was to run just a simple Gibbs sampler in a Gaussian mixture model case and um, impose some identifiability constraints. If anybody's a deep stato in the audience, I imposed some identifiability constraints to ensure that my sampler didn't explore the um, permutation space in a, in a, in a non-standard or nonsensical way. But fundamentally, I ran a standard Gibbs sampler and plugged it into the kernel density estimator and I also just sampled a million draws um, from the prior distribution, so I kind of brute forced it um, and um, plugged those into a conventional kernel density estimator to compute the marginal likelihood in that particular case. And you can see that there's agreement between the Gibbs sampler and the prior distribution, i.e. they're both um, suggesting that a three component, in this case Gaussian mixture model, is appropriate for that particular data set. So that gives me some confidence. That's consistent with what every time a statistician analyzes this data set, they always come up with a number three. Um, so that gave me some confidence that this approach actually works in practice as well as in theory. So just to summarize, um, Turing used to have a really cheesy phrase, and you'll see the bag that I'm carrying today, which says, we utilize data science to change the world for the better. And um, actually, Alan Turing himself and his appreciation, and Jack Good, their appreciation of Bayesian statistics, um, if you forgive the cheesiness, did ha actually help to change the world for the better because that is fundamentally the approach that underpins the work that they did at Bletchley Park. And we should also actually recognize Jack Good's contribution in that. Um, I've hopefully suggested that there are some interesting Bayesian challenges still to be solved in statistical data science. and. Um, and just because we're in a big data world doesn't mean that you can actually discard all of your expert opinion and, and all your statisticians. Um, we still need to ensure that we are doing robust and rigorous statistical analysis of data, even in a big data world, even when we're applying deep learning techniques. 
Um, in this talk, in terms of the work that I did, I introduced a simple L kernel density estimation idea based on the output of a Markov chain simulation. And in the paper that accompanies this presentation, I've demonstrated some theoretical results to suggest that's more efficient than the standard approach, which is a kernel density approximation. Um, and whilst you may think Turing is doing a lot of work in deep learning and ethics and all kinds of cool stuff that we are doing work in, um, you may be surprised to know that, um, or maybe not, um, Turing Institute is also at the forefront of research in Bayesian modeling and inference. And um, a lot of my colleagues today will be talking through um, the great work that they're doing in this um, domain too. So with that, I'd like to thank you for attention. If anybody's got um, any follow-ups that, you know, I'll be around for 20 minutes or so, but if anybody's got follow-ups that they'd wish to kind of talk to me over email, that's my email address. Please feel free to email me. I'll get back to you as quickly as possible, but thank you. <laughs>